So hi everyone, I'm getting the notice that we are live on Facebook. I'm giving folks just a minute or so to find us. So if you're here for the noon Eastern live cast with yours truly, Jamie Marich and Mark Sandlin, you are in the right place. So if you're joining us for the live cast and in the comments, you may want to know where you're joining us from in the world, please feel free to do that. That's sometimes fun to see where people are, are joining us from. And Mark, remind me what part of North Carolina you are in. I am in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is almost in the center of North Carolina. Yeah, 77 cuts right through there, yeah? Close, yeah, it does, right across it, 76. I'm mixing up the boroughs. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm mixing up the boroughs. So if you're just joining us, I'm giving folks a minute or so to find us, and I'm making sure that everything is cooperating here on the Facebook end. And then we'll go ahead and get started with what I hope is going to be an exciting, exciting conversation that I'm especially happy is happening during Pride Month. And of course, you know, I think every month should be Pride Month, but it's, it's nice to have a, a month where we particularly celebrate it, so... All right. Okay. So welcome everyone to our noon Facebook live cast, whether you're here live or whether you're joining us on the replay later on Facebook or YouTube. Thank you very much for coming and taking part in this very important conversation. My guest today is Reverend Mark Sandlin, and I have shared his article, Clobbering Biblical Gay Bashing, so many times since I think it was written in 2011. I found it probably around 2012. And I share it in clinical courses I teach. I share it with queer folks who are struggling. I share it with their families. And I kind of have this feeling that if this isn't theologically going to convince you, I don't know what will. So, Mark, I want to you know, thank you from the bottom of my heart for writing the article. And thank you for joining us today. Well, I appreciate it so much. And thank you uh, for the one of the kind words about this decade old article, uh, but also um, just for having me here. Uh, this is obviously uh, an important issue for me as well that um, I've been much like you addressing in any way I can for you know 20 some years at this point trying to uh, I don't know help people get a better understanding of what's really going on and, and who they really uh, a clearer understanding of, of the issues and who they're supposed to be in relationship to those issues so I appreciate this opportunity very much to be with you Excellent. So tell us a little bit about your spiritual religious background, because I know you're one sure. of the founders of the Christian left, whose work I followed for years, and ProgressiveChristianity.org, yeah. whose things I've been reposting a lot lately. Yeah. So you are ordained in, in which denomination? And I'm ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA, PCUSA, have been for a couple of decades now. Um, I was actually in business before that. I went back to school to uh, do this. So uh, uh, it's a it's a passion of mine in, in several ways. It's a faith passion, but it's also a passion of that uh, I, I left one life behind in order to pursue pursue this. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that I, I, I felt like the church was hurting people from misinterpreting things, just like what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, and I, I knew that I needed the education, the background to be able to do that and to counter those uh, ways of going about doing theology in church uh, so that we'd be healthier and treat each other in a better way. So a lot of it was about that. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, so I, I've experienced it the other way. <laughs> and I was very aware of it. Uh, but uh, now I feel really fortunate to be in a place to where I get to be a part of these conversations and maybe reach out and help folks who haven't had the opportunity to hear a non-evangelical Southern Baptist kind of uh, a traditional or even more conservative reading of biblical text and who we should be spiritually. So th this has been exciting for me to be able to be a part of it from helping with the founding of the Christian left to uh, being on the board and helping uh, progressivechristianity.org move forward and, and hopefully in a healthy way where we continue to work on all these issues and hopefully from us, you know, both faithful, spiritual, but intellectual perspective as well. Yes, most definitely. And it's interesting, even as we're talking about the Christian left, I no longer hear my father's voice saying there's no such thing. Uh, <laughs> it's 
to me, how can you not, right? And, and I think that's part of my journey. And for people who don't know my work, I grew up half Catholic, half evangelical. I had one Catholic parent. I had one Assemblies of God parent. So I tend to know scripture pretty well, but then there's this whole idea of what does scripture even mean? How do you interpret it? And any of us who grew up queer or queer allies know these clobber verses, typically Leviticus and a lot of the Pauline scriptures that, that get cited to condemn homosexuality. But let's start there, Mark. Sure. What does it even mean when people pull out, but the Bible says? It means whatever they want it to mean. Yeah. There, there's <laughs> At least in their heads, it does. You know, the reality is that's a, it's, it's a, almost a nonsensical statement. Yes. Because the Bible, well, in an overly simplistic term, is 66 different books. And but even within those books, and the and the Catholics will say it's 72. Or That's 72. right. And even 72, I think. And even within those books, like Isaiah probably is a couple of books. Right. Uh, so first, you got to realize that. So we got different authors writing about different things and different styles with different purposes uh, and written at different times. Uh, you know, we're, we're spanning at least a thousand years in this book, depending on how you date everything. So to, to say that's what the Bible says and just kind of put it like uh, like a, a, a flag in the ground is is it's a it's absurd. It's ridiculous because the only way you can know what the Bible says and you can't know it, you can only begin to guess at it is by going deeper into the text and not uh, uh, cherry picking a text and just quoting the verse. You've got to put it within context. You got to understand who the author is. What were they trying to do? Who were they writing to? What style were they writing in? Was there anything that was supposed to be poetic about this, symbolic about this, metaphoric about this? I mean, there's just... <laughs> I could, I could, if I could breathe a little quicker, I could just keep going and going and going on all the different pieces that you need to be aware of to really truly understand what may be going on in any given text. Right. And what we end up with is people who don't want to be bothered with that or haven't been educated that that's a reality uh -huh. and would prefer to find the ones that seem to support what they already believe and then using those verses, which is dangerous very dangerous so you know what do you consider to be and again i know this might be a matter of who you ask sure what is the and i don't even know if it's the right thing to say what's the proper way to interpret the bible but we use ah. words a lot like hermeneutics exegesis i'm wondering if you can give people like just a little 101 on what those mean sure absolutely i mean i think for for me what we're talking about here is both of those words really ultimately refer to a lot of what I just rattled through yes. is that we, we need to get back one. It's sometimes important to get back to the original language and figure out what that meant context contextually, because sometimes the interpretation into English is wrong, or at least as questionable based on who's doing the interpreting and what they might feel like it's supposed to point towards. But more importantly, uh, there are different ways, depending on the type of writing that, that you're looking at mm -hmm. and techniques that have been proven, not just with the biblical text, but with other ancient texts of how to approach breaking them down and sort of getting in behind the words on the page and starting to understand the uh, social economical setting that it was done in and how that might be influencing, understanding uh, what the current theological settings in the immediate area were and how they might have impacted it. I mean, it can get really complicated, but if you're going to make these texts important, then it's equally important to be serious about understanding them and not just allowing them to say what you want them to say. Right, right. So in terms of cherry picking, I can't think of any better example of that than Leviticus. Hmm. Um, and the, the Old Testament Leviticus yes. passage that gets cited. And, and what has always humored me is in the context of everything else that gets cited in Leviticus, I mean, we should be stoning children, right? Yes, well, disobedient children should not just stoning them, but stoning them in the public square. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, don't get me started on shrimp. Um, I don't understand how we're still okay with shrimp. If we are going to do a, a literal reading of Leviticus, that and... You know, football, I don't know how people keep touching that pig skin. It's really uh, in, in, improper. Uh, we could go through a list of things, cutting the, the, the side of your hair. Um, so many things in Leviticus that were really a purity code. What was going on was 
Leviticus was trying to, was a time when <clears throat> they were trying to establish itself over and against the rest of the world. We're a little bit different. We're not the Canaanites. We're who we are. And we all, they also were doing it based on their current, let's call it scientific understanding. Although by today's measurements, we wouldn't call it that. It was some lack of science, if anything, where uh, they felt like everything needed to fit within a particular purity code. Like there were things that were correct and things that were right and things that weren't. And if you didn't fit into it, all fish should have fins. So if fish don't have fins, then there's something impure about that and you shouldn't have anything to do with it. Right. And that's the kind of uh, hermeneutics, exegetical work that has to be done on any verse like these that have been uh, misinterpreted, in my opinion, is that you've got to start looking at what's the real purpose of what's going on and what that might say to us about the texts that are hurting people. Because I have a really hard time following the teachings of Jesus and believing that anything that Jesus was supportive of meant to hurt people. Uh, so if it's hurting people, something must be going on. And ultimately with Leviticus, we've managed to decide that uh, bacon wrapped shrimp is pretty good to eat. Uh, and we managed to ignore those. We've also decided that it's maybe a little bit over, overkill to throw rocks at our children. Um, I don't so, go ahead. Because I don't know very many Christians who keep kosher, you know, talking about the no. bacon shrimp and and you know something else about leviticus i'm hoping we could talk about is a little you know discussion about who were these men that even wrote leviticus what was going on at that time because having a lot of friends of the jewish faith i have some that are orthodox that that will take a more literal read on leviticus although i will ask them about stoning the children and how they reconcile that and i have other friends that are a little more reformed or, or modern in their interpretation of judaism who have told me things like we understand that very traumatized men wrote leviticus <laughs> and it was a lot of their stuff that that ended up coming through in in these these purity codes so you know help <laughs> us understand who was it that even wrote leviticus well i mean we, we were talking about the the uh, Israel, it's, uh, their leaders and their scribes put this together once again to kind of to define themselves over and against the Canaanites, but also to let's just be honest, it was a bunch of men. They were wanting to uh, kind of promote their masculinity and reinforce who they were and how important they were and the things that that were most central to their identity. And so particularly when it comes to sexual stuff, well, if, you, if you get really in behind it, you realize that a lot of what's going on is both a uh, personal issues of the folks who, who wrote it down combined with a lack of basic understanding of science. For instance, at that particular point in time, uh, all of life was held within sperm because of course the men would hold life. I mean, women just were kind of incubators. So uh, we end up with some, some Levitical laws Pure, but they're purity laws um, that are based on that idea. But that really has everything to do with a really unhealthy understanding of um, uh, the relationship between men and women uh, and, and even just the basic science of it is that they were trying to establish their, their supreme ship of everything, including owning life itself when women were really the ones who were the most important part of actually giving birth. But we end up with uh, Levitical laws that, that, that seem to go in the opposite direction and really put an overly high value on, on the sperm of men because all of life is in it. Mm -hmm. So for Christians, there, you know, what I was raised with anyway in both churches was this idea of that like the New Testament is kind of trumps what's in the old testament although people like to pull out the old testament for clobber verses when they when they like it so yeah. let's, let's go to the new testament and what are some of the clobber verses that are there and how many of them are from paul uh, all of them are from paul <laughs> <laughs> of course because of traumatized unhealed men yes um and, and with paul with paul in my opinion anyway it really comes down to um two different approaches that Paul takes in order to try to start going after uh, this in the way that people use it, it being an anti-LGBTQ uh, versus that, that he does. The first one's uh, it actually out of uh, Romans. Um, and it's really um, up until this point, all of the things that people point to have been about male-male relationships yeah. in, in the Bible. You get up to Romans and all of a sudden the ladies get included. Yeah. Uh, 
congratulations. Uh, it's it's good to belong. Um, and really, if you break it down and look at, at what's going on there, while people try to make this about a, a, a same-sex relationship and that being wrong, actually what Paul is talking about is going against um, who you are, who you're created to be, who you, who, what's real for you. So going, pretending or being something that you aren't is the actual problem here. Yes. And so the truth is, if you read closely, Paul's really arguing that if you are gay and trying to be straight, life's going to be harder on you because you're trying to be something you're not. That what you should be doing is being who you truly are at heart, who you are in your mind, in your heart, and in your life. That is what Paul really clunkily is trying to, to, to encourage us all towards, is to being who we were created to be, who we are as people. Um, and for me, that's, that, I mean, we can go way into the breakdown of Romans, and frankly, it's not all that interesting, um, but that's the bottom line of what he was really trying to do there. Mm -hmm. um, and then you move on into both Corinthians and 1 Corinthians and uh, Timothy, for a first, first Timothy. And uh, we've got a whole different set of something that's going on there. And it gets real complicated because it does use some Greek words that we don't have a lot of representation of outside of the Bible. Uh, but when you break it down, it really tends not to be about an equal relationship, a male-male equal relationship. Uh, sorry, ladies, y'all got left out of this one again. We switched back over. Um, this is really about uh, if you, that word in some ways that people are translating as homosexual really is a word about uh, male prostitution, specifically male prostitution of younger uh, men, boys, really, um, and frequently in conjunction with uh, some existing religions of, of, of the time. And so what you're looking at is saying what's what Paul's upset about here is that someone's using their power over and against someone of lesser place and not in the same position to be able to express themselves. And I agree that is a horrible thing and it should never happen, whether it's same sex relationships or heterosexual relationships or any other kind of relationship. Um, yeah, that's a horrible, horrible thing. So, but to try to use this to say that consenting same sex relationships are somehow wrong when, when, if you contextualize it, if you put it, if you break it down and start trying to exegete some of the language that's going on, it's really clear. I mean, really clear that this is about the abuse of a younger boy by an older man. Mm -hmm. Um, when it's not consensual and not healthy because of the power dynamic that's going on there, the boy really has no choice. And, and in any sexual relationship, that is not appropriate and it's not okay um, to be using your power and position to force something on another person. This is one of those cases of bad translation. Yes, exactly. 100%. And it's, it's, it's sort of difficult when you look at the translation, original translations to rec, it's sort of difficult not to think that some of it was a little bit intentional. Like it was easier to go this way and it served some political purpose and kind of got pushed in an unhealthy direction. Uh, Cause this one, boy, if you, when you break it down and look at the original language, there's not a lot of, not a lot of question about what this is trying to talk about. Not at all. Yeah. So, Oh, so many places we can go with this. And then yeah. I, my next Sorry. question is, are, and I'm, you know, this is a new part of the thread, trans folks, because here we're talking about sexuality. And then I think we need to, to talk as well about gender expression. Sure. In, in my feeling, there's not a lot of clobber verses that are pulled out. But what I hear a lot is this idea of, you know, God doesn't make mistakes with natal sex, and you should just accept to right. signed. So how do yeah. you I think what, what I see is people will, will try to go back to Genesis creation story and misuse that, that man and woman and not really even understand that the original text there isn't man, it's human. Uh, and then, you know, and, and, and so they're misusing it just off, off the, the top. 
Uh, but they're also trying to use a text that could not talk about sexual identity, uh, sexual expression, because they weren't realities when all of this was written. No, people didn't, they were real in life, but no one understood it. No one had, had been able to express it in a way that we could all kind of grab a hold of the concept and begin to understand who we really are as people, how we're wired, and how we experience life. Um, and so for me, it's just a, I, I, I have folks in my life who this impacts directly, uh, very important people to me. Um, and when I see people try to use the text to somehow justify this, I, for me, it's, I, I don't have as much patience as I probably should because it's, it's, an un, it's again, pushing what you want to be in the text onto the text, and you're doing it in a really clumsy way because the one or two places you can even try to call on creation story, for example, it's not trying to address the idea of sexual, sexual expression or identity. It's not even coming close to that. Matter of fact, it's not even trying to talk about how many sexes there are supposed to be in humanity. This is a creation myth story. This is about why do, did these things happen and, and trying to get into some insight in this thing we call God, this divinity's relationship to creation. It's not supposed to be some kind of a science manual for sexuality. Right. It never attempted to be. And as I point out in the article that you use from time to time, that would be a really not... I guess I'm more prudish than I think I am because I am not for biblical sexuality. Um, you know, some of God's chosen men, and they were always men, uh, were polygamist. Uh, uh, we could go on and on and on of all the interesting. And if that's your thing, that's your thing. I'm, I'm I, uh, it, it wouldn't appeal to me. So I wouldn't want people trying to force that kind of biblical sexuality. But the good news is that was never what the Bible was trying to do. This wasn't, a, a, a manual about sexual identity. It wasn't about sexual expression. It wasn't about in, anything like that. So trying to over and over again, use it as if it were is dishonest. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to go as far as saying the moment you start introducing God into that discussion, it's, it's also blasphemy. It's using God's name in vain. It's putting your words into God's mouth. And that seems like a bad idea to me. Right on. And what's also interesting, and this is going into my next line of questioning, mm -hmm. like when you talked about the creation myth, you know, I'm down with that for sure. But again, I have those old voices that used to be in my head, like, no, but it actually <laughs> happened. You know, if it's in the Bible, then it actually right. happened. And, uh, and this is where having my perspective of being like half Catholic, half extremely Protestant raised, you know, I got to hear a lot of these battles over my dinner table wow. about things like the creation myth and Sola Scriptura this document uh, that or this idea that a lot of evangelicals will pull out that like if it's in the bible it has to be true that the bible is the only authority left behind um and, and the thing i hear i see this on memes all the time and it drives me crazy like you know times may change but the word of god is constant and whatnot and and i mean for me um, that that's just not good common sense let, let alone yeah. good theology because we've learned a lot more about humanity than we knew in 2000 any of the times that it was written any, and i even argue that in the 20th century because having come up in the 12 steps for my recovery mm -hmm. i'm an advocate of of more trauma uh knowledge within 12-step communities and i tell oh, you yeah. we've learned a lot more since 1935 Turns when out, found it. Like we know more about the brain, we know more about trauma, and so using that same idea, we've learned a hell of a lot more. Yeah. Than than since when Leviticus was written. So I mean, to me, it feels like common sense to weave that in. But why do you think, or what? What? what I, I think everything that we're talking. I know where you're going, and I think everything we're talking about is exactly why people still hold so dearly onto the scripture having some kind of magical powers from above that make it always right. Mm -hmm. And that is because as we have learned more, we've revealed more and more the spaces where this text wasn't what we wanted it to be or thought it was, or at least a whole segment of, of Christianity did. Um, and, and so 
it's much more simple to allow this idea that it is magically blessed, even though the, the book itself doesn't even really say that it is. Plus, it would be hard for it to say that it is because then it's trying to talk about what's being written as it's being done, which it gets that's a whole time me, why me, twisty, turny thing. I don't want to get involved in there. But ultimately, what we're looking at is, is it's a nice magical way. And, I, and I'm using that word on purpose. It's a ma nice magical way to be dismissive of any of the real scholarly work that has been done on the biblical text in the last, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Because, well, you can say whatever you want. They can, they can respond. You can say whatever you want. You can try to twist the words of God. You don't know how many times I've been told that that's what I'm doing when I use uh -huh. exegesis or anything like that. You're trying to twist the words of God. And what they really are saying is, I want them to mean what they meant when it made me important. Say that again. I want it to mean what it meant when it made me important. And that is ultimately in everything that the Bible's used to hurt other people. That's some of the real human origin of where it comes from. I need to be more important than others. Yes. And I think of a teaching from Nadia Boltzweber that I cite a lot, which is yeah. Our drug of choice is thinking we're better than other people. Could not agree more. <laughs> it's, it, it explains so much of the wrong in the world. Right. And I know even as a progressive Christian, I could get into a little of that myself when oh, I, I think it's I human, think isn't it? I mean, you know about better than I do, but it, some of that's almost human survival instinct. Right. Right. So in terms of the whole soul of scripture thing, I mean, I think there's that verse in Timothy about, I think it's Timothy, like the Bible is God breathed, something like that. I don't know, I'm, I'm missing my scripture. But then like where the Catholics will argue is nowhere does that say that scripture is only the authority and that the tradition of the church can, can matter as well. And I actually think that's, that's a cool idea if the Catholic church tradition wasn't so hateful in a lot of ways, right? Uh, but part of that idea of honoring church tradition and or honoring the evolution of thought is that we have to look at what other quarters of learning are finding as well. Yes. And I, and I think particularly in the world that I kind of work in, in terms of the Christian world, I, the progressive theology kind of side of it, uh, those are essential uh, uh, in the way that we approach our understanding of faith, spirituality, and even the biblical text is that we are aware of all these other pieces of advancement in human thinking that can be used to make us even more aware of who we should be, what the texts are trying to communicate, uh, and places where we're using it incorrectly and hurting people with it. Right. Um, and the Protestant, Protestant Christianity is important, I think, to pull up at this point and mention is that it never really was fully based just on biblical text. It depends on, you need to look at the Methodists who have TULIP and you, I mean, there's all these different ways to uh, say, how does God speak to us and how are we supposed to understand who we're supposed to be in the world? And Protestant world in general doesn't say it's all the text. There's there's life experience. There's the movement of the Holy Spirit in some of them. Um, there is the dogma or the tradition of the church for some um, that are all equally important. So ultimately, though, it all comes down to um, a lot of folks trying to figure out how can I use it to promote my own agenda. Right. Which brings up a teaching that I really like from Reza Aslan, the, the scholar. Oh. oh, yeah, that, you know, God doesn't hate gay people. You hate gay people. Exactly. God doesn't hate, insert whatever the group is, you hate it. And, you know, what That's is, exactly. you know, what is this tendency we have as humans to use God to justify our agenda? Well, it's certainly, a, it's certainly easier than having to ex accept the hate as our own thing, isn't it? That's for sure. Whew. When we can, when we can put the hate into the mouth of some undescribable, unknowable, in charge being or spirit or energy, and have just be able to say, "Oh, I, you know, I, I understand," but I, I, I don't have any choice. This is this is God's word. When the reality is, it's just yourself. It's what right. it's, you're promoting your own agenda and what makes you feel good about yourself. 
Uh, and that's one of the things that I've learned over and over again. It's frequently, it's not as much that you're hating the person uh, mm -hmm. that you're directing all this at, although you're doing it in a hateful way. It's, it's, it's much more about needing to be important. Right. And someone who doesn't look enough like you, it's easier to point towards their, the things that aren't you and make them negative, which should build you up because you're not those things, at least the way you're processing it, how it plays out. And what, gonna, what grates at me now is if we're going to take that dance, like, oh, it's in God's word. There's a lot of things in God's word that I... But you may not want to... You know, we, we've already talked about some of it, like in Leviticus, but even in you know New Testament teaching about divorce. And I certainly don't judge divorced people. I'm divorced twice. And again, Same. you know, I, I'm grateful for the compassion that was shown on me to understand the context, right, <laughs> around those situations. Thanks. Thank goodness. I certainly wouldn't be here talking to you if people did it. <laughs> right, right. And it always just, just, uh, you know, to quote Peter Griffin, grinds my gears when, <laughs> when people bring up that, you know, it's in God's word about homosexuality and it's often right. divorced people that are doing that. Absolutely is. It absolutely is. Uh, and, you know, it's hard not to become judgmental about the folks that do that. Um, <laughs> Because it does play back into the exact same thing we're talking about. And whether you are doing it because of it or not, it makes you feel a little bit better about yourself because you're not that. And so there's this really interesting fine balance line of um, calling out something that's inappropriate, that's hurting other people without feeling like you that makes you superior to the folks you're calling out. And that can be difficult. It also can be guilt inducing. Mm -hmm. Um, at times when, when you're really passionate about it uh, and you hear yourself say something that could easily be understood as, well, at least I'm not that, or at least I'm better than that in a lot of ways. Um, I think that we all, we, we all can struggle with that and have to work a little bit on how do we get past that and how do we do it in a way where we're not playing into those very basic human desires to, to, to be more important or to to separate ourselves in a, on a higher level some way. Right, right. So we have quite a few people with us live right now. If any of you have a question for, for Pastor Mark, please go ahead and put it in, in the chats. We've had a lot of yes, fist pumps. I think we're largely friendly people who are with us today. Lovely. And, uh, but yes, if you have a specific question, please uh, please go ahead and, and drop it in. So um, the, the other, I think where I'd like to go next though is talking to you a little bit about because I think I've realized like with my family, with people who have, let's say different, and, and I and I look at it as they have different interpretations of scripture and Christianity, right? Sure, absolutely. It's, it's all an interpretation game to me. Ultimately it is, yeah. You know, I, I wrote a blog during the election about so much of this rhetoric that Joe Biden's not a real Catholic, quote unquote, and that's still inflaming right now. And yeah. I wrote a piece called, who are you to tell me I'm not really a Catholic? Uh, because there's so many things you're forgetting about <laughs> in right. condemning him, right? Well, you know, that's, that's a whole that's a whole other thing. Even in progressive Christianity, particularly when it started online catching on kind of um, heavily my eight to 10 years ago, there was this whole argument of who gets to call themselves Christian. Yeah. And it was a very serious pursuit for a while from several folks, including myself, who were uh, kind of helping carve out some of the ways to be progressive Christian online and in the uh, uh, social media world. Um, and ultimately, I came, I was trying to say, do we need a new word? Do we need a different word? Well, let the folks who the, these traditional Christians get to keep Christian. And, um, but I think where you were heading, who, who gets, to, who gets to define that? And, and should anyone get to define that? It's actually a difficult question because aren't categories helpful? Well, what I teach in my work is I think identifiers can be helpful. Labels are not necessarily. Um, and, and you can argue that both ways. I think it's largely, sure. about, you know, how it's being used. So, yeah. you know, I think I'm largely speaking to you now as, you know, someone who's queer identified, someone who's an ally, who still identifies as having a pretty Christian soul. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm spiritual, I, I'm very ecumenical. I draw on a bunch of different traditions, but I mean, the incarnation is fundamentally within me. So, and, yeah. and the funny thing is, calling myself Christian, a lot of my liberal friends will look at me askance for that, right? Yeah. Because of what, what Christianity or even Catholicism has come to represent. So, right. so and 
I think this might be too big of a question to answer because you may need to know the context of the individual family member, but how do we handle our family and friends, especially our family? Because for instance, for me, uh, you know, keeping it very personal, most of my family members are not on board with what we're talking about today. No. So what is the most loving way to, to, you know, hold, hey, this is who I am and this is what I believe while also approaching them with, you know, because I, I, I've tried to stop convincing them. And yeah. Good thing or not. So riff on that if you would. Well, no, I, I, I think it, it all is circumstantial information is really important and all of that. But in general, what I would say is if they are trying to convince you that you're wrong, mm -hmm. you have every right to say, uh, well, here's why I think what I think is right. Mm -hmm. I, I do believe that just trying to use a pure, not just think from experience, um, trying to just use a theological argument of why it should be different than what they think, right. or you know, let, let me break this down hermeneutically for you so you can under, that's not going to work. No. So why, why are you bothering? You know, is it, are you feeling this once again, does it feed into our sense of superiority that I know these things and you don't, I don't know, because I can't tell you it almost never works. Right. What works is relationship. And if we get in these fights and arguments about who's right and who's wrong about their interpretation, right. that relationship gets harder and harder to hold tightly. Mm -hmm. And, and so for me, when a per, when you when you're with someone who wants to see a let's talk specific LGBTQ issues, when they want to see those issues in a negative way from in terms of how the Bible addresses it, um, relationship is the thing that's going to most help, uh, particularly relationship with someone who identifies or is in the community. Um, I've seen people change almost overnight when someone they care about uh, talks to them about, listen, here's my reality. Right. Um, it's For me, it's relationship. I've seen that change people in all kinds of different spaces, whether it's racism, sexism. But in, in this particular area, I think it's, it's more impactful than maybe in any, any of the other spaces. That when someone you care about, someone you have a real relationship with, um, shares their story, yeah. it opens up a part of us that even if we have been brought up in a very kind of conservative, intentionally closed minded space and world, uh, we're also that world is still teaching people to love their family and to love the people that are close to them, mm -hmm. regardless of all the other teachings that's still there. And you have access to that through a part that's not just the brain, yeah. not just the intellectual pursuit. There's an emotional piece to those relationships that is frequently a better entryway into helping open a person up to, to recognizing the harm that their particular perspective is causing. Uh, and then you do get the opportunity to move to the next step and saying, hey, do you want to look at some of these verses that have been used to hurt folks and why maybe even using them was not the, the best way of doing it? You got a lot better chance of talking to them about uh, hermeneutics and exegesis at that point than you do before. Right. I don't know if that was helpful in a, that kind of general scenario, but. And, and in that, I was thinking of this phrase that gets used a lot about, you know, I love I love the sinner, but I hate the sin. Ugh. I know exactly. Like if I every time I, I heard that <laughs> happened when I came out to you know one family member in particular yeah and I think at the time I would have been like all right I love you despite your but it's like what what is sin really and yeah. well and then that's a whole different argument and well, and we and, and our conservative traditional churches have made it something that if you do get into the, the theology and break it down and into the exegesis it's not what we think it means. It's exactly. really just means missing the mark on something that's important. Mm -hmm. that, that's all is sinning left and sinning right is where the origins of that word is. But um, for me, though, even the saying, uh, what, what is it? Hate, hate the sin, love the sinner. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Yeah. yeah um, for, for me, that's like, and I put it this in, in that article, it's like saying, uh, hate, uh, love the pizza, hate the toppings. Well, I mean, the toppings are the pizza. It's the same thing. If you're saying you get to hate part of it, then you're hating all of it. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're not affirming that it is what it is in front of you. Um, I have one friend who responds, if you can hate the sin, uh, I always mess that saying up because uh, I hate it so much that I have ne- I don't speak it that much. If you can what hate this, love the sin and hate lo- love hate the sin and love the sinner. Mm-hmm. He's like, well, then I can I can hate the belief and love the believer. Yeah. Um, that, that that that's how ridiculous it is. You're you're saying something that's so essentially a part of you. Um, I can hate that, and am I not hating you in doing so? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just looking at, at a question here. Oh, it's all good. Uh, yeah so um because this is almost probably a whole other issue that we can get into which is about you know there's there's we, we, we i need to have you back because this is we can probably of, make that happen this is kind of getting into the issue of you know how a lot of theology is used to justify abuse like the whole forgiveness oh. rhetoric and 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 all of that and, and, yeah. this, and this is a question like, i really want to honor because it's from somebody i grew up with in the church and um you know she's saying i've left the church divorced my abusive husband you know i'm raising ptsd kids from sexual abuse by a christian i have a child who's struggling with being transgender or should i say i struggle with it giving what i've been taught in the church for me i believe her trauma is a major deciding factor once the trauma is healed she'll be okay in her body you know and that goes against the science it does about about what we know that trauma does not cause gender identity no. trauma does not cause sexual identity absolutely um you no know, and again this is a very good woman i can attest to you know i think and i think a lot of christian parents are this like genuinely struggling to reconcile what they've been taught yeah and, and you know wanting to be the best parent you can be for your kids um you know and and i think you know how can here's the fundamental question how can i hold on to the hope that they'll heal their wounds from trauma and be the little girl i've known or the person i should say i've known their whole life or am i just to accept this new identity i know acceptance is what everyone desires i think i'm looking for encouragement and guidance on how to be best uh, for them Yes, and I will say um, acceptance is what everyone desires. I mean, I've gotten to a place where I'm I'm strong enough at this point to be out even with my family. But I know there are snide comments that are made about me. I right. know, I, and I had to deal with a lot of shit at the beginning. Oh, no doubt. And I mean, a lot of this is there's nothing more harmful, I think, than being told that who you are is bad Why? and I, i'm curious i'm gonna i'm gonna, can i flip the tables on you and ask you a question when you complete i want to come back to what you just said oh, oh go um, i'm curious as to knowing that how you, the, the family you were brought up in kind of the two-sided theological nature of what you were exposed to when when you can when you were first coming out and you were dealing with the shit that was being thrown at you i'm curious both at what your personal not necessarily uh, institutional but your personal faith belief system spirituality where did it help and where did it hurt oh such a good question such a good question i you know wow it goes back to what we were saying from romans Mm. that i knew that being my true self would bring me closer to god yeah because what 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 Growing up in both churches, what I loved the most was the music. Okay, fair. Singing and just like being so present in my body when I sang and really believing and fully feeling that, that you know, God is in the music. And when I came out to myself the first time at 19, I connected into that same sense of truth and peace and like, you know, this is who I am and there's nothing wrong with this. But everyone else thinks there's something wrong with it. And I have a lot of that to unpack. And I didn't come out to my family at 19 because I knew I would probably lose them based on what they believe. So I had a lot of, uh, I'm grateful for the the people in both faith traditions because I did meet people in both faith traditions who did encourage me to explore for myself and to ask questions. And I think that was, was very important. And like I said earlier in this call, fundamentally, the incarnation is the teaching that keeps me anchored in Christianity in some way. This idea that God thought it would be cool to be a human. Yeah. And so for me, that means embracing all of this mess of the human experience and the wounds and the trauma and realizing that humans take on various shapes and sizes and identities. And I I still believe that with with all my heart and and I'm sharing what I've shared with so many gay friends and queer friends and trans friends who have come out 
and still identify as Christian, that we feel closer to God now. Yeah. So I, 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 this is coming from, from my kind of ministerial yeah. working with folks. And, and this is a great opportunity for me to, to learn. Um, it sounds like you're saying in terms of your personal spirituality was the core thing that helped you was this almost this strong internal sense, how it got there. I'm not going to, I was about to try to investigate that this strong internal sense of unconditional love from uh, this thing we call God, this higher yeah. being that that was the piece yeah. that most made you ultimately. Okay. Because God knows what it's like to be human. And in all of the traditions I've studied, because I also have a pretty strong yoga practice and you know, the non-dualistic nature of reality, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And even in those camps, I can get like, you know, don't deny your humanity because that's, that's where divinity most shows up. And yeah, I know it is, it is love. It is unconditional acceptance. It's mercy. Um, and, and I don't know when I die, who's going to be right, who's going to be wrong with our interpretations. But I mean, I don't want to kill myself today. Right. And when I get in and when I have gotten into the thorns of like the right and the wrong and the theology and, and the, the judgment, that's where it just feels. And as I shared with you before our formal interview, I mean, I've lost too many friends to mm. addiction, to suicide. Yeah who were not validated in who they are by people who they loved the most and by who they saw as representatives of God, meaning, yeah. meaning their church. And I, and I think what my, my, you know, the, the basis of my theological <laughs> roots in both churches coupled with recovery has taught me God is bigger than any church. Right. God is bigger than any denomination. God is bigger than any theology that I frequently say, why would you want to worship a God who can be contained in one denomination? Thank you. Um, <laughs> just saying, uh, but I, I want to back up just a little bit and just say how important I think it is that your internal sense of that there is this divine experience that has an unconditional love for you was still able to flourish in the midst of all of these institutionalized religions who are actually saying love is conditional. Yeah. That's, that's important. And I, I think that'd be fun to explore further. How does, how do people still get to, some folks are able to continue to hold on to this understanding of there is this unconditional love out there for me, in spite of the fact that the institutes that are supposed to be teaching me about it are telling me you can be, have unconditional love if you meet these conditions. I found it in music and in other people. I found it in other people. I, I wrote a blog not too long ago about my third grade teacher who recently passed away and how she showed up as Christ for me. Wonderful. And yeah, I mean, that that's what cultivated it. And again, it was like, it's so big, a church can't <laughs> contain it, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of my brothers and sisters and humans who I've lost along the years have used chemicals or other horrible behaviors mm -hmm. to try to keep it contained. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say horrible as a judgment, but just other like, yeah. you know, stuff. Damaging, behaviors, damaging. Behaviors, yeah, uh, to, to try to keep it contained. And yeah. And I've, I've heard, I'm, I'm sure I've heard all the trolling shit you've heard as well about, you know, oh, this, is, this is a soft theology. It's not the truth, you know, this, that, um, and the other. And I guess I'd li like to wrap it up on, you know, how do you deal with that personally? Um, I guess, I guess my ego's big enough, frankly. Um, when people come at me with that kind of stuff, I, I know the work that I've done to arrive at the understanding and conclusions that I, that I've, uh, that I've arrived at. I also know how open I am to seeing new information and augmenting what I thought I believed because I now have new data. Mm -hmm. And so th the folks, it, it, you know, it can be, it can feel like you're drowning when you first start getting those kind of folks that come after you and talk about how, like, for instance, I've been called a false prophet. I've been called the mouth of Satan. You know, all of these just absolutely. And honestly, at first, it hurts a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's like, you you know, I'm, 
but after a while you start realizing that's exactly what what it's supposed to be doing is hurting that's the purpose of it and if you're certain of who you are and if what you're doing is coming from a loving place and that you've worked hard at educating yourself and making sure that you 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 know your shit so that you can present it in the right way uh well let them be who they are i i don't even read that stuff anymore personally i i let them have their i've had my say so i just I don't even try to, I used to get online and some person would put up some little comment like that. And I would try to type out the rational, I'll, I'll prove to you. That, and now I just like, you know, I've had my say, I'll let them have their say. I don't need, I, I know where this will go if I interact and it's not healthy for either of us. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a personal relationship with you. So I know yeah. I, this is not my job right now. Right. So I, I think that was the question you were answering, asking, but. That's good and it's helpful. And, and I think what's what's what I have found most harmful is most of that I've gotten has been from my own father, you know, who I do mm. love very deeply and yeah. been called sure. and whatnot. But I mean, fundamentally, even though I'm still healing a lot of those wounds, it is like this is this is who he is. And and I and you know, this is this is going into a bigger conversation, but I truly don't begrudge people their right to believe and practice what they feel is right for them. Um, I, I just, here's get, what I taught my kids. Yeah. I said, I don't care what you believe as long as it doesn't hurt people. Right. And if it helps people, I give you bonus points. Yeah. I like that, that was my whole life lesson for them right there. I, I wasn't that, I probably could have taught them about, you know, accounting and keeping your checkbook, but no, that's what I taught them. Those three things right there. Yeah. That's, that's a very practical theology. And, and if you feel like you have to, you know, because even with very conservative people from many faith traditions, I know, uh, I truly believe if it helps you be a better person and show up that way in the world, party on. But I'm with you 100%. This whole idea of imposing what is a fundamentally your interpretation on the rest of us and how, you know, that seeps into government, which again, we could have a separation of church and state <laughs> live cast. Another big one. <laughs> and, and what that even means. So, oh, Pastor Mark, it's such so great talking with you for this hour. And how can people follow your work? If you want to give that a plug as we wrap up. Sure, that'd be great. Uh, I haven't blogged in a while, although I'm about to start back up and that's all at revmarksandlin.com. Um, but you also can just Google Mark Sandlin. Uh, be careful because there's two more famous folks out there. One's a Baptist photographer and one's a Lego builder. So <laughs> make sure it's me. <laughs> uh, odd, odd that you would have two, three, two other folks, Mark Sandlin, who would pop up during a, a search, but also anything with the Christian left and particularly progressivechristianity.org is where a lot of the work that I'm doing shows up. And then you can find me mostly, I tend to stick on Facebook, but uh, I'm in most of the, the social media places as well. Great. So again, thank you so much for joining us and I hope to have another conversation soon. We can make that happen, I'm sure. <laughs>